All right. Well, hello, everyone. This is Mary Beth Kingston, and this is our ongoing series highlighting the, the issue of workplace violence, specifically in healthcare. And I'm delighted uh, to have a really wonderful guest this morning, and I want to tell you a little bit about her as we get started. Um, Lynn is uh, just an unbelievable um, person and expert in this field. She's currently the president of Lynn Van Mount LLC, a private consulting firm. And um, she was also a senior director of threat management for a large multi-state not-for-profit healthcare organization and the past national director of the United States Veterans Health Administration's Workplace Violence Prevention Program. And predating her executive leadership roles, Dr. Van Mal's clinical practice focused on post-traumatic stress disorder recovery. Her work in violence prevention and behavioral threat assessment and management has pre been presented nationally and internationally. She served on the Joint Commission's Technical Advisory Panel for Workplace Violence, and her work in violence prevention solutions for healthcare settings uh, was published in the 2016 Journal of the American Medical Association. And I could go on, but I'm going to pause there. So, Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so just so grateful that you're here with us. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's my honor. Thank you. Sure. So, you know, we've talked a little bit um, in a in uh, a prior session about threat management, about threat assessment, really more and risk management. But I did want to um, just ask you, jumping right into it, how does threat management, so the threat's been assessed, how does threat management fit into a comprehensive healthcare workplace violence prevention program? Because we all know what we want to do is prevent violence from occurring. Absolutely. And thank you for that awareness because it's a part of a much larger system and bigger whole. So when we think about violence prevention, starting at the beginning with our employees, every voice, every set of eyes, every ears, um, all the people who are in our workplace environment need to be trained in order to be able to recognize signs of escalation, be able to intervene in the moment with an appropriate match to the level of escalation so that we're not overshooting the mark, but we're not falling under it of what the behavior is, knowing what to do to stay safe. And then afterwards, having a voice to share that, a reporting system, a mechanism for letting people know what's actually happening in their workplace, as well as what they are yet concerned about could happen. So if there's a behavior that causes a concern for safety, we want to know about that if we're going to make our workplaces safer, safer which is where I think in the previous conversations you've had, those reports then go to be assessed. And there are evidence-based, data-driven ways to assess whether or not a behavior poses a safety risk. Someone may have made a threat, but doesn't pose a threat. Someone could never have said a specific intention of harm, but all of their behavior indicates that they could actually pose a very serious threat. So we wanna take a look at that balance. And then once we've assessed the situation, then and only then after we've thoroughly assessed it, do we move into managing it and putting together a strategy for how it is that we can address the individual's unique balance of risk and protective factors to be able to then create a plan for delivering healthcare as safely and effectively as possible. And then we have to communicate that strategy out. So we have to close the loop back to our employees who are now then re-educated in how to handle this person so they can give us some information about how it plays out for them so we can reassess, remanage, and it fits into an entire cycle that's a comprehensive package. And threat management and communicating its plan is just one part of that. So I think that's really an important thing to think about because it's, it. so what you're saying is it's not always a blanket approach. Now we know there's some foundational things that I'd like to get into, but you're also saying you've really got to look at the individual and at the situation in order to develop a very strong threat management um, approach. So once a behavior is identified as causing a safety concern and that's evaluated, what can help, I mean, this is the big question, what can healthcare organizations do to reduce the threat uh, that this behavior might pose? A couple of different thoughts, different answers to that. First of all, um, there is no such thing as an if-then approach to this work. 
So you've done an assessment, you've done a really great assessment. And there's no such thing as if a low risk of violence, then send a letter. If a medium risk of violence, then place an electronic health record alert. If a high risk of violence, then make sure security is always on standby. There is no if a this, then do a that. What we have to look for is if all learning. But no, 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 no. I mean, it would be absolutely wonderful and it would make my life and everyone else yes. so much easier if we could just publish that chart at all times, do a this, then a that, and you'll be okay because we want to do it right. We Thanks. want to know that we've done a good job and we want to keep people safe. And the best way to do that is to not fall into that trap. It has to be customized. So once we do that assessment, what we're looking for is if these behaviors are present, then you might have a risk of this behavior, this concern, that this behavior poses a threat of what, towards whom, under what conditions. And then our management plan addresses those points. So if these behaviors load up onto the possibility of a threat, then that informs the strategy. We can't jump the gap and go straight into the strategy. And the strategy that works the best, the data that we have currently at this moment in time, are to load protective factors into the balance. There are some risk factors that are static. They will not change. They're historical variables. We're not going to undo the past. We might be able to block and kind of reduce some risk of happening, but the main thing we want to do is to put something in place that will stop the, the risk, regardless of what the risk is, from occurring at all. And those are protective factors. There are about eight of them, eight to 10, that we are finding in the literature right now that are most important. And almost all of them are leverageable in healthcare service delivery. Healthcare access is, in and of itself, violence prevention. It's really cool. We're, healthcare organizations right now are wrestling with this across the board. You know, they and leaders want to do something. You know, how can I keep the people who are providing care safe? So can you talk about what we need to do to what are those protective factors um, and how do we how do we communicate them and how can we actually keep staff safe in addition to identifying kind of that customizable plan? Just what else can we and should we be doing? So let's break that down into um, things that you can do for the individual, the low okay. protect factors, and then reducing the risk um, or target hardening, right? So, so, healthcare is what we would call a soft target. We have numerous doors, numerous ways in and out of our buildings. We want to create an open and welcoming environment. And in so doing, we create easy access for everybody to come into our spaces. Unfortunately, sadly, these days, people who may have malicious or dangerous or lethal intentions. So as we take a look at, quote, target hardening approaches, we can look at our physical space, our physical environments. Do we have uh, passive weapons detection systems? Do we have um, places where people need to check in and monitor who's coming and going from our buildings? When we do that and someone does not comply with our protocols, do we have a response that is effective? to be able to deter someone from access before they get to a target. Um, we find with predatory violence or intended violence towards an individual that folks are often researching and planning this kind of an attack for months, years before they actually transact it. So training our staff and being able to recognize what those behaviors are that could be concerning. Why is this person always coming in at the very end of visiting hours and did we anybody ever monitor that they actually left the building, right? What was happening? What were they researching while they were here? So some physical security pieces and protocols around making sure that we know who's in our buildings and that we know what they're carrying, having lockers that are available for people to store their things before they go into certain areas of the hospital, and then to pick them back up again. Lots of strategies that we can learn from our colleagues in physical security who have done this work wisely and well in other industries for decades. And then we can get the behavioral safety going with the protective factors, things like you want to access to healthcare. Um, do you have the ability to manage your pain? Do you have the ability to connect with other people who are socially supportive of 
handling grievances in a, in a positive way? Do you have a sense of belonging? Can you cope with stress? Can you meet your basic financial needs? If not, can we refer you to any kind of assistance programs, scholarship programs to be able to continue to get your health care at a rate that you're able to afford and payments that you can meet? Can you manage debt effectively? Um, are you, do you have a sense of spiritual connection? There, there's a bunch of these protective factors that we can load into someone's life. And if you wanted more information on that, I would definitely invite you to take a look at the work of Dr. Eric Elbogen, E-L-B-O-G-E-N. He's a fabulous researcher in this area, and he's published a lot on these protective factors. So that would be an opportunity to, to dive deeper than we can do today during this conversation. Yeah, but you know, it's fascinating because I think many times we do jump into the technical pieces. So, you know, a lot of people are looking at um, different ways of alerting security when there's an issue, because many times it is a patient um, situation. That, and and that's a, that is a more complex area than in other types of uh, businesses and, and areas. You know, it's, we're caring for patients, but I love the way that you've incorporated the social drivers of health, because what we often do, I think, is we, we attribute this potentially to a behavioral health issue or, or, or something else, something along those lines. But what you're saying is trying to identify what those frustrating stressors might be before be, and, and before someone really exhibits um, some type of aggression or behavior and that being under that type of stress um, can contribute to it. I think that's a great connection. And actually, now that many organizations, most or healthcare organizations will begin screening for social drivers, um, that may actually help us incorporate those into our kind of our clinical assessment, if nothing else. So I think that's really uh, a great connection that is somewhat overlooked. I think we look at, as you've mentioned, behaviors. Um, we look at what to do when violence occurs and don't often get you know, further downstream. We do threat assessment, the visitor management programs, the weapons detection and those type of things. But do we really look at those individual stressors um, that someone might be experiencing? So that's a fabulous point. Just that. Yep. Thank you. Because rarely, you know what, rarely do people come to medical centers and our hospitals because they're having a great day. Yeah. <laughs> <You know. laughs> we are come in loaded with anxieties, with concerns with stressors. And then on top of it, the other stressors in our lives and our health isn't great. That's why we're here. And healthcare is about healing. It's not about what is the consequence? What is it that we're going to do to quote, punish someone for their bad behavior? The behavior they're bringing with them might be part of the issue for why they are struggling to begin with. So if we can maintain that compassionate stance towards our patients, our staff may find that they're more able to remain engaged because they're not getting so burned out with people who are hitting the brick walls of uh, the frustrations of our systems. So those are, it all plays together. And um, grievance is the first step on a pathway towards violence. So when we ourselves are the source of the grievance and we create systems that generate those grievances on top of stressors that people already have, we're in light and diffuse. We're, we are seeing um, in something within my organization, but organizations across the country, um, increased aggression, particularly in, I'm, we're seeing it with adolescents that have significant social issues where they're staying in the hospital for months because there is not a way, there's not a place for them within our society right now. And so I think those social support structures are so important and, and can really play a role as we strengthen them in, in decreasing workplace violence too. So I, I really do like that connection. So you've mentioned some of the things we can do. One of the things that I think most organizations at least have tried or um, some places do it beautifully and have it across the board, but is de-escalation training or um, some type of preparation for staff and how to how to interact with people, especially if they see them beginning to escalate behavior. Can you speak to that? Um, is it Has it been effective in your experience? And is there any approach that you would recommend? There are numerous programs that are designed specifically for healthcare. 
they are proprietary in nature. There are numerous vendors who um, are available to teach, train, and implement those in healthcare settings. So I want to be very careful that I don't come across as promoting any one particular one of them as they are designed for different venues and different situations. So taking a look at them, though, across the board, the invitation would be for people to um, be an educated consumer of them and have some certain criteria you might look at these programs through um, some lenses. One would be, are you starting out with an awareness that everybody needs great customer service training? the ability to recognize the signs of escalation of behavior and be able to know when someone is coming up so that we can then escalate just enough to catch them and then help them come back down again, as opposed to they start to escalate and we go, bam, and we overshoot the mark. They'll meet us. They'll come up and escalate to catch up to that same space. So when we are dealing with education programs, once again, there's no one size fits all. Are you able to differentiate when good customer service would be helpful so we can bring it back down again? Is that about verbal de-escalation skills? Do people then understand the tipping point of when to move from verbal de-escalation into we're hitting a boundary now and this is behavior that is unacceptable and I'm going to set a very clear limit on this behavior and if you can meet this limit, then we can stay. If not, I'm going to have to ask you to terminate this appointment and we will reschedule. Or do we need to go all the way up into requesting security or police intervention? And in rare cases, do we need to lay hands on someone in a non-tissue damage, non-pain-based compliance way of interaction that allows us to continue to deliver healthcare safely? And those are situations that often aren't available to us in outpatient settings. They're inpatient focused. So then we have to know what levels of training to offer which employees for the skills they can actually use. And then that gets into using your own data from your healthcare system to drive the alignment of relevant training to the staff that you have and where they're working and what the actual behavioral hazard is that they are facing. So there's a lot that goes into creating an appropriate and robust training program. It's not simply about buying something off the shelf, making everybody take it, and then checking the box and saying, again, darn it. <laughs> darn it. I, but I do think that's, I think that's uh, also an excellent point because you have to, we have to remember that the inpatient setting is not the only place where we're experiencing workplace violence. Um, I think your point about having this customer service, like as a, as a, a front end, so it's, it's not about just educating clinical providers in how to get out of a hold or something along those lines or how to how to really help someone deescalate when they're when they're obviously getting upset. But it's about um, people who are calling for appointments and can't get an appointment and how do you how do you help them through that and how do you how do you again back to the access, how do you provide the access? So it's a the training piece has a lot of different levels to it. And I think that's an important message for our listeners to think about um, how we approach that in our healthcare organizations. You know, it's kind of fun about that. You've, you've reminded me of a nice little factoid that is emerging from the literature, uh, emerged actually from the literature many years ago around the different levels of training. And if people have training and know that they can handle a serious escalation, they are much more likely then to intervene at a lower level, which is where there will be much more effective outcome. It's like trying to stop a boulder at the top of the hill versus down at the bottom before it smashes the little village in the, in the mountainside, right? So knowing that we can address a bad behavior, people are more willing to keep the boulder from rolling because they feel they've got a safety net. But it's before the boulder starts rolling that we will be more effective. So don't let the boulder roll to begin with. If everybody is on the equal playing field of we've got a verbal opportunity to keep this from escalating, they're more likely to jump in and to actually do it and to promote safety that way instead of waiting till it gets all the way up here. But if it did get up here, knowing they know how to handle it, they're more likely to intervene down here where they're effective. So the better trained people are, the more likely it is they'll use the skills that actually will do the job of keeping escalation from happening to begin. I think people are, people providing healthcare, again, we've talked about this, they're very empathetic. 
They want to do the right thing. And I think sometimes with some of the, I guess you would call them introductory behaviors, but that the lower level violence, which could be um, intimidation or it could just be an insult, something about your appearance or, um, you know, something along those lines. I think, I think people are often willing to just kind of brush that off a little bit. Would you say that's a mistake to do that? Okay, fine. So you do it once, but how often do you let it happen? And once becomes twice in the day, becomes three times in the day, becomes you personally are then getting constantly berated and it's undermining your ability until at some point in time you've had enough and the next person who comes in doesn't get the best of you when they are possibly at the worst of them. So there's a problem there to begin with. And we are not in a space where we should be allowing people to have the the expectation that subtle forms of violence are acceptable. So they're not. It's not okay to be bullied, to be intimidated, to be harassed, and to calmly and collectively say to someone, you know what, we employ people in this organization across all backgrounds who are fully qualified and competent. And we are very proud to be able to offer Dr. So-and-so's services that meet your specific need, right? And it doesn't need to then have to be a racial slur against Dr. So-and-so because that me we're, we're not talking there. We're talking about quality of healthcare delivery. And then it's up to us as an organization to make sure that this doctor is fully supported in his or her or their clinic to be able to be empowered to say, I am a fully qualified and competent provider, and this is the service that we provide, and this is your choice to receive your care from me. So we don't need to allow our staff, we shouldn't ever allow our staff to have to endure these kinds of experiences solo and without support from our organization. Yeah, I think that's an important message to get out to people too. Um, and, and then, and how do you do that in a way that doesn't escalate the behavior too. You know, how do you set those boundaries and, and interact with folks in a way that lets them know the parameters of, of behavior, but doesn't doesn't then start to get people also very agitated and upset. So Lynn, in our last few minutes together, if you had to give uh, our listeners some advice about, you know, what components uh, in our, I mean, you've just brought up some excellent points. What would you, you know, not just how would you start, but what would you say are the must-haves in a really comprehensive program? Just one, two, three, a couple, a few things. One, all of you who engage in the program itself and implementing it and running it have pathological persistence. Keep going. Always keep going. Um, It takes a special person to want to turn toward this work as opposed to turning away from it. So for those of you who are listening and those of you who are engaged and care about this work, thank you very much. You are the number one thing that an organization needs to be able to have a successful workplace violence prevention program. People who care and want it to be different and are dedicated. So that's the first thing. The second thing, please, please, please have a multidisciplinary team that is able to be fully trained in effective and evidence-based, data-driven threat assessment and threat management best practices so that all of the, there's no wrong door, all of the reports of behaviors that cause a concern for safety come to this multidisciplinary team because you have to be able to have a broad net of people who can collect the dots to connect them effectively and accurately so we can move forward together with them and provide health care. So that'd be number two, multidisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary team. And um, number three is this is never, ever, ever, very rarely once and done. It is constant. It's ongoing. It's iterative. So just because we handled one report once about this one particular patient or person doesn't mean that we aren't going to see them again and see them again and see them again. So please do keep up with folks and know that this is a circular kind of pattern as opposed to a, a once and done workflow that goes out towards an end result and then you're finished. Great. Well, great advice and and really some great connections uh, that you made today that I think will be very helpful for those listening. So um, to everyone listening and to Lynn, Lynn, thank you for being here. Um, you are indeed an expert in this field and uh, um, have enriched our conversation and our understanding of 
really the goal, which is preventing workplace violence. Um, and to, to our listeners, thank you for continuing to be engaged, as, especially as Lynn mentioned in your leadership roles um, and your advocacy work, as we work very hard together to bring awareness to this issue and to work together to, um, to really put into place those best practices and, and evidence-based practices to prevent workplace violence and create a safe healthcare environment for everyone, patients, families, community, and those providing care. So take care and thank you.